condition and I've been doing infectious disease for about 30 years. I'm from Australia and I became interested in MS about five years ago and over the past four or five years I've been working with Gavin and his team at, uh, at the Royal London and more recently with the team at uh, Queen Square at UCL. And I must say, having come into this field relatively late in my career, that you should all have absolute confidence in uh, the team at the Royal London at UCL because I think they're probably the best clinicians and researchers in the world today. So I think that you should be pleased with that. Now, um, my job is to update you on the Charcot project, but I know that many of you weren't here last year. So um, in order to update you, I need to go back and tell you what I spoke about last year. Uh, and so the first thing is that it, what I'm going to talk about is not simple, and uh, an MS is not simple, and like so many other things we face in the world today, they aren't simple, and it's impossible to make them too simple, as did um, Einstein observe. Um, the Charcot Project, uh, it, we decided to name this after uh, Jean-Martin Charcot, and Charcot was a French neurologist, a brilliant neurologist in the 1860s, and he actually described MS and a whole range of other conditions uh, 16 specific neurological conditions. Not, he's not very well known, he was actually quite eccentric. Um, so we decided to name this the Charcot Project and at that time he described multiple sclerosis as a triad and you can see uh, intention tremor nystagmus which is twitching of the eyes and scanning speech and, and that uh, combination of conditions became known as multiple sclerosis. One of his um, contemporaries, uh, very soon after Charcot described MS, came up with the idea that in fact this condition was caused by an infection. Um, so the whole idea that MS may in fact be caused or triggered by an infection is very far from new. Uh, and it's been, it's been around now for well over um, a century and a half. But uh, it's very complicated and, uh, and uh, all over the world there are researchers that are working on little bits to do with MS, some are working on vitamin deficiency and others are working on uh, on uh, EBV and others are working on hypoxia and others are working on many different causes uh, for MS and it's really a little bit like this. Nobody's actually been able to pull it together and drive it away and um, I'm and that's really the interest that I have. How do you pull all this together? How do you make this into something that we understand? And by making it something that we understand, we can actually make a difference. And that's really what I'm going to talk to you about over the next uh, 10 minutes or so. Now, I'm going to jump from different things. And, and even though it may be complex, I, I actually can't make it simpler. And what I've done is to produce a few pamphlets, which I've left on chairs. And what I'd like you to do when you have time is to have a look at that. And if you can, to go on to the website, uh, the Sharko Project website, and also to have a look at clinicaltrial.gov. And you'll learn a lot more about it and um, we've given you some contacts there. There are two sorts of viruses that infect humans, okay? One sort of virus is the cold virus or the hepatitis virus or the polio virus and those viruses are transmitted uh, in the air or by different means and they affect specific organs, okay? And then the body develops resistance to them and you can get the common cold or, or the influenza virus by somebody coughing over you in the tube and you get it and then your body develops resistance and the virus is effectively eliminated and if you get exposed to it again you've got this resistance. So that's one type of virus and we know about 
lots of those viruses and many of, the, many of us catch them each year. But there is actually another sort of virus and this is incredibly fascinating and really we hear a lot of bits of fascinating information every day on the television but for me this is perhaps one of the most interesting. There's another type of virus and that virus is actually transmitted by person to person contact or transmitted from mother to child for example. And these viruses are only now starting to be understood. And the way we started to understand them is when almost the greatest human scientific achievement occurred, which was mapping the human genome. And this took thousands of scientists, billions of pounds and decades in order to do, but over the past 10 years they were able to map our genes and find out what are our genes and what they found of course as you know that our genes are made up of these helixes of DNA which make up our DNA and, and these base pairs they're called ACTG um, and what they know is that in each of us in our chromosomes we have about three billion of these base pairs okay but we in fact only use about 3% of those, and this is open to discussion, we may use about 3% in order to transmit all of our genetic material from one generation to the next. Interesting. But what's even more interesting is that they found out that of our DNA, about 8% of our DNA actually came from viral DNA which was incorporated into our DNA over about the past 40 million years. It's an interesting concept. So 8% of our DNA actually comes from viruses. And in fact, this observation, which has only been made in the last few years, in fact is the most important evidence for evolution. And one of the most interesting questions is, well, what, what do these viruses do? Viruses make up 8% of our DNA. Do they just lie there? Are they just junk? Do they do nothing? And these are relics of past infections. So generations uh, going back to, to uh, rodents who they've found were our past ancestors and going through the, uh, the evolution of Homo sapiens, they've been able to find the same viral DNA being passed from, uh, from species to species, unchanged. Okay, now, there's a reason that I'm telling you all this. How does this relate to multiple sclerosis? In the early 1990s, some researchers in very small uh, laboratories in diverse places around the world who were doing research into these type of viruses and trying to figure whether they've got any place to play in human illness, were able to find in certain people with MS these type of viruses which were part of our DNA. And what they hypothesized is that instead of these viruses or the viral DNA lying dormant in our DNA, in fact something happened and these viruses were somehow activated, somehow turned on and actually became evident in people with MS. So what they did is they isolated viral particles from people with MS and they suggested that in fact by activating these viruses they were perhaps one of the causes for the problems, the degeneration of the myelin. And more than that is of course you know that the theory is that MS is an autoimmune disease, so the body forms antibodies against your own myelin. 
Okay, so the idea is that if you have a virus which is part of your genetic material and it is turned on or activated, the body will respond to that as if they were developing an immune response to your own body. In other words, an autoimmune response. Okay. So this was found, but there was a lot of controversy. People didn't believe it, it went backwards and forwards, and in fact a very important paper was published in The Lancet in 1991, but immediately, uh, and it was published by a, a controversial researcher called Hervé Perron, and immediately, even in the same issue of The Lancet, a whole lot of people jumped up and said, of course, just another dubious virus. So this theory of perhaps a viral cause or trigger for MS has had a lot of detractors over the years. But we are very interested in this. And not only are we interested in it, we have some evidence to suggest that in fact it may be one of the unifying theories for multiple sclerosis. Because what we know is that if you've had EBV, Epstein-Barr virus, which we know everybody with MS has, or vitamin D deficiency, these upregulate or turn on these viruses. We know also, for some, from some research, that in fact people who progress more rapidly through MS are more likely to have these type of endogenous viruses activated. Now these are not viruses that you pick up on the tube, they're not viruses which you get, they're viruses which are part of your DNA. You were born with them, we all have them. The issue is what turns them on and why are they turned on in some people and not in others. So, we've been doing a lot of work in this and last year I suggested that we may start to do a clinical trial of a drug which had been around for a long time. And we put in a, um, a proposal to, to the MRC and a number, of, it was reviewed very well by some people, not reviewed well by others, and the MRC decided not to, find it, to fund it. But in the meantime, we made some observations. And it would take me a long time to tell you, but basically, as a result of these observations, we're now launching a unique clinical trial. In fact, this is the first time in the world that this sort of study has been done. And the trial is called the INSPIRE trial. And what we're intending to do is to take some people with uh, relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis that have active um, lesions on uh, MRI. And we will be looking at the effect of these viruses, these viruses that are incorporated into your DNA, with the idea, for the very first time, of controlling MS rather than modifying the disease. And this is a real shift, a complete shift away from all of the treatments and all of the approaches that have been tried for MS so far. In order to do this, we're doing a pilot proof of concept study because we can't really convince anybody to put the tens of millions of pounds that would be necessary for us to do a definitive study. So what we're doing is we're taking people that have got active relapsing remitting MS that have had either a gadolinium enhanced lesion on MRI in the past three months or a relapse in the past 12 months, in order to uh, get the right people for the study, we're probably going to need to screen about 45 people. They will be treated, they will be followed monthly for three months, and then they'll be treated for three months. 
And what will they be treated with? They'll be treated with a wonderful drug, a drug that I've been using now for many years for people with HIV. Now you may say, why are we using an HIV drug to treat people with MS? And the reason is, is because these drugs act on those viruses which are incorporated into your DNA. And these drugs are the only ones that do. This doesn't mean that MS has anything to do with HIV at all. It just means that we're using a drug which we know works in, for people with MS. So there is no relationship, but this is a wonderful drug for people who have HIV and we think, and we have some evidence. We're doing it on the basis of some evidence that we have. I'm sorry about this. So we're looking at the rate of development of lesions. We're looking at disability and quality of life. And we need 19 people to finish the study in order to get a statistically significant difference. And all of this is in the pamphlet that you've got on your seats. And it's all available on uh, the website that you've got. And we're more than happy to answer questions. So the trial will last over 12 months. And I must say that we were able to design this trial and get it approved and hopefully enrolling the first patients within one year of actually starting it. And you hear all the time that it takes between five and seven years in order to get a clinical trial up and running, in order to get results, in order to move things along. We hope to ha we did it in a year, and I hope to be able to give you results within a year or 18 months. So we're moving this along extremely quickly. We have a very eminent steering committee, many of the people that you know and many of the names, many of the names that, uh, that, that are involved and collaborations not only with the MS Society here and in the US but with investigators in Denmark and in the United Kingdom. And I leave you with just a thought because there are a lot of detractors for every new thing that happens. There are a lot of people who have got reasons why something shouldn't happen. But as Jonas Salk observed, exactly as this, and, and many doctors would now agree with these statements, so I leave you with just that thought and look forward to coming back next year and giving you another update on what we're doing. Thank you very much.